Hi, I'm Alicia Butler-Pierre, and I have the pleasure of being on the Online Prosperity Experience show with Mr. Prosper Taravinga himself. And we're going to be talking about business infrastructure. In particular, how can you set your business up for sustainable, repeatable, profitable success when you have so much growth that you don't know what to do? That's what we're going to be talking about coming up in just a few seconds. Now, welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. And today, I've brought you the smooth operator herself, Alicia Butley-Pierre. Alicia, how are you doing today? I am doing even better now, Prosper, that I am on your show talking to you, and I am ready to rock and roll, my friend. Oh, stop it. I'm actually <laughs> starstruck right now that we have you on the show. Alicia, I mean, for those that are watching the show right now, Alicia is a chemical engineer turned entrepreneur, and she has advised, designed, and optimized processes for organizations, including Coca-Cola, Shell Oil, the Library of Congress, and the Home Depot. Now, you can understand and appreciate that, um, you know, Alicia is on a quest to revolutionize the way small businesses operate. And if you are watching this show right now, you would understand that our mission and goal is to make sure that every small business is profitable and enjoyable. So Alicia does that by speaking, coaching, writing, lecturing, and podcasting. So we've brought her onto the show today so she can tell us a little bit about how she's become the founder and CEO of Equilibria and become the best-selling author behind, uh, of a book called Behind the Facade and also the world's first published book on business infrastructure. She also hosts a week weekly business infra infrastructure podcast, which ranks in the world's top 2%. And she also is an instructor of lean principles at the Purdue University and an operations management at Nichol Nichols College. Now, Alicia, you can hear I'm mincing my words because I'm still shaking in my boots, just looking <laughs> at your you know, rev, uh, resume that you have brought together. Tell us a little bit about how you actually got started and what's actually happening with you right now at Equilibria Inc. Well, can I first ask a favor? Can we take this show on the road, Prosper? Because you would make an excellent hype man, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. You, just, you talk to my people and, and, and you will talk to your people and make, make that's that right, arrangement. That's right. We'll make it happen. But, but in all seriousness, the way I got started, as you mentioned, my career began in chemical engineering, which is unconventional in and of itself. And the way I became a chemical engineer, I must give credit to my high school chemistry teacher, Mrs. Kablis, who was uh, Ukrainian. And she recognized an aptitude that I had that I didn't even realize I had in myself because Prosper, I actually wanted to become a journalist. And when I was in high school, I, I and my teacher realized I had this aptitude for chemistry. So when it came time to start applying for university, I started putting on my applications that I wanted to pursue a degree in chemistry. And she pulled me off to the side and she said, Alicia, you know, let me tell you the thing about pursuing a degree in chemistry. You would have to go all the way up to the PhD level before you start to make real money. But if you pursued a degree in chemical engineering instead, you would make money right out, right out the gate. And so I wish I could tell you, Prosper, that I grew up and I saw all of these women in engineering or women in STEM careers, or I just had this aptitude for engineering and I, I loved the field, but no, it was, it was because I wanted to make some money <laughs> when I finished university. That, that is truly the, the, the motivation of why and how I became an engineer. But I will say this, once I started working as an engineer, that was when I really developed my core specialty in processes because a lot of people who may not really realize what a chemical engineer does we usually work we go down one of two paths we either work as process engineers and what that means prosper is that let's say if you're in a manufacturing facility and we're making i don't know orange juice 
or something like that. As a process engineer, I have to figure out if a batch of orange juice does not meet certain specifications. As a process engineer, I have to figure out what went wrong in the process of producing that particular batch of orange juice to cause it to not meet the specification. The other way that we typically tend to work is as design engineers. So imagine you come up with this special formula for orange juice that you want to package and sell, and you're making it at home initially. But if you really want to scale that prosper, you know that you can't keep operating this from home. Eventually, you, you're going to need, need to be into some type of factory or a manufacturing facility of some sort. So as a design engineer, I would be able to literally design the equipment that would allow you to take your operation from your kitchen table to a, a full-on manufacturing facility where instead of producing uh, you know, a certain number of liters, of your orange juice a day, you would be producing uh, at a much, much higher volume, barrels, barrels and barrels of orange juice a day. So that is how my career started as a chemical engineer. As I started working, I realized I had a serious deficiency in business. And when I finally decided to go back to school to pursue a degree in an advanced degree in business, I'll never forget it. I had an accounting professor and he referred to accounting as the language of business. And let me tell you, Prosper, I was not fluent in the language of business. And you so know. what would happen, right. So I didn't, you know, I, I I didn't have a true appreciation for profit, profit and loss statements, income statements, <clears throat> cash flow statements, balance sheets, looking at uh equity and assets. And I know you and I, we may even have a conversation about funding. So all of that was just foreign to me. And so I went back to school and I would say, Prosper, that was the missing link. I had the technical aptitude, right, to do the technical work of engineering, but I didn't understand the business decisions that would drive some of the things that I was being asked to do as an engineer. And I'll pause here to see if you, you know, if you want me to keep going, but. Um... Oh, absolutely. There's, there's a lot to unpack there. But um, what I really wanted to maybe touch up on is hats off to all the teachers out there. Some that encourage kids and some that actually prod kids in the right direction. I also have a, had a teacher that uh, sort of inspired where I'm at right now. When I was 13, we had a foreign uh, exchange student teacher from Australia who actually inspired me to want more, be more and have more. Hence, we're having this conversation here. But also some other teachers may have been along the journey, uh, you know, telling kids that they would never amount to anything. So they all come in different um, you know, sizes and measures. But I'm also really keen, um, you know, on, on how you then took on the world of STEM and actually made it your own, especially, um, you know, how you sort of ended up, um, you know, working in, in bigger places like Coca-Cola, Shell, and, um, you know, the Home Depot, all these places I can imagine, they are sort of filled with male dominance. How, how does, you know, that sort of work with you? And is that the reason why you left those industries? Well, when I worked as an engineer, well, first, maybe I should go back to university. So you're right. It's, it's engineering, it's chemical engineering. And there were often times when I would not only be the only female in the room, but the only person of, in, in America, we say pe people of color, but I would be the only black person in the room <laughs> as well. But you know, I learned something very early on about that prosper. I learned to take what some would consider to be a negative and turned it into a positive. Let me explain what I mean. I started to appreciate the fact that because I stood out, my professors would remember me. So I could easily be in a room of 100 plus students, but because I was the only one who looked like me, they remembered me. They remembered my name. They remembered my hustle. They remembered my drive. When I would show up and, and ask them questions, when I would go to their offices and, and say to a certain professor, hey, I'm having trouble figuring out how to solve this particular problem. Let me show you what I've, the, the work that I've done up to this point. They saw my hustle. They saw my drive. 
and they wanted to help me. Um, so I, I took that and I, I've just applied that in every single situation. And it might sound really, I'm sure it sounds crazy to those who might be listening or even watching this right now when I say this, but I really don't see differences when I walk into a room of people because I'm so used to that now, if that makes sense. I'm sure you can relate to that, Prosper, being that you're from Zimbabwe and you're now in Australia. But if you want to focus on it, it can become an impediment, right? If you start, if you focus on it and you just can't ever get past your difference. But if you instead learn to leverage, you know what? I know when I walk into this room, I will probably be the only person that looks like me. And that is okay because all eyes will be on me. And once I start talking, they'll realize how great and wonderful and phenomenal I am. And I'll just start to attract all these people to me. That's much different, right, than walking into a room being shy and intimidated and thinking, oh, my God, these people, will anybody even talk to me? This is, I'm scared, I'm nervous, they're not going to like me. Very, very different mindset. So I have taken that and I have learned to turn it into a superpower, if you will. So yes, I can I can hang with the best of them prosper <laughs> when it comes to the guys and 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 knowing how to handle myself and how to conduct myself and still garner that respect. Because even to this day, we can we can have our fundamental disagreements about things. But one thing I absolutely do not tolerate is disrespect. So you will respect what I've been through. You will respect my position. You will respect my authority, the things that I've worked so hard for. None of this was given to me. It was earned. And once people are clear on that, and once we can work past that, then we can actually you know, focus on the, the work at hand. But to answer your question about why I left corporate America, I hated it. I hated it. I absolutely loved being inside of corporate America. And when I decided to leave Monsanto, that was my first job out of college. Please don't judge me. I always preface that by saying, don't judge me. Uh, but I learned so many, so many wonderful things about Monsanto. I learned, I knew that I didn't want to be in a chemical plant for the rest of my career. I knew that very early on. I had the very good fortune prosper of meeting the person who would become my next boss. He owned his own engineering consulting firm. It was a family owned business. And that was when I got my taste of the small business world. Vastly different than the corporate environment that I left. Because when you were in this family owned business, first of all, there weren't any silos. So I got to see what the sales and marketing teams were doing and how it directly impacted the work that I was doing, being in a more operational role. I also got to see what the, the folks over in, in IT were working on. I would interact with people in HR and even the legal team sometimes. So I had that exposure, a type of exposure that I did not have before being in this huge giant corporation where again, I was in a silo and the left hand did not know what the right hand was doing. So being in this small business environment, I started to see the interconnectivity of the work that everyone was doing. The fact that we were all contributing to the much bigger picture. I got to see that interconnectivity firsthand. And the really cool thing is as I was attending business school at night, Prosper, I could apply the concepts and the theories that I was learning in school directly to my job at that time. And so at that point, I was working as an engineering consultant. And that's when I started working at Shell Oil and you know a couple of other different oil refineries. And eventually I left, I was living in New Orleans, Louisiana, and eventually I left there and relocated to Atlanta, Georgia, which you mentioned Coca-Cola, this is the headquarters of Coca-Cola. And I thought, I thought I was going to have a job at Coca-Cola and that didn't happen. But here's what did happen. I never became an employee of the Coca-Cola company, but I certainly have done work for them. They have been a client of mine. So it's just very interesting how life works out. So you mentioned some of these other organizations like the Library of Congress here in the U.S., 
also the Home Depot, a couple of other really large corporations. I've worked as a contractor or a consultant to those companies, but my my absolute love is for small businesses. Absolutely. And we all love small business around here because, you know, it's the mom and pop shops and the consultants and the coaches that we end up working with that have actual direct impact, um, you know, on, on some of the, you know, economic infrastructure of different GDPs. So good on you for choosing, um, you know, our side. And also, I just wanted to then, um, you know, ask this question for some people that might not have sort of that experience in uh, corporate America. Is there a huge crossover or can you take on the processes, operations and systems from the corporate cycle and just plug them into small businesses? Or is it a whole totally different uh, animal altogether? Believe it or not, I'm so glad you asked that question. It's actually not that different. I, I'll say this, the biggest difference is the, the level of technology that might be at play. For example, if you use something like Dropbox, as a solopreneur or a much a micro enterprise or a very small business with like, let's say less than 10 people, you might be using Dropbox for business, a Dropbox for business account. But if you were in a much larger organization, they would, of course, be using the enterprise level. So, so that's that's one major difference. But at its core, processes are processes. At the end of the day, Prosper, it's all about capturing what you do and how you do it and making sure that it's captured in such a way that if for whatever reason you were away from the office, whether you're on holiday, you're out sick, or for whatever reason you just aren't around, would someone be able to pick up that process and within reason follow that process and produce roughly the same result as if you did that work yourself? That is the core of process work and it doesn't change depending on the industry, the size of business, processes are processes. It's all about making sure you capture information such that it's such that the work can be performed in a very consistent way. One way that I like to describe processes to people for those who might not understand the value of them or might be on the fence about how, how to cap capture them or document them, think of processes as your company's recipes. So I want you to think about your favorite meal at your favorite restaurant. Would you be able to go home and replicate that meal? Would it taste exactly the way it tastes at your favorite at your rest at the restaurant? If you were to go home and try to recreate that, more than likely it wouldn't. But let's say now, Pro Prosper, you you have a list of the ingredients. Would you still be able to roughly create? that same meal and have it come out the exact same way? Again, probably not. You need the steps. Well, you have to turn on the oven and this is the temperature that you have to have the oven at. And, and these, are the, these are the specialty types of uh, utensils and other kitchen tools or gadgets that you might have to use. But you get my point, right? Knowing the, knowing the ingredients isn't enough. You need the actual steps. You need to know the correct order of the steps so that you can recreate that meal. That's what processes are. Absolutely. See, every year, big companies are spending millions of dollars on consultants, you know, like yourself, so that they can document their business processes, like you mentioned there. But as a small business owner, they might not have that luxury, you know, to have, um, you know, consultants coming in and actually document the whole process. Um, how do you, you know, save businesses time and money, um, you know, in, in the way that you're not running your company there at Equilibria? Sure. Okay, one, one major thing, I am a huge fan of video. So you can take something as simple as your phone and you can just start recording yourself and you can talk or describe how you perform a certain task at your company. You're recording the audio, right? Look at this. You're recording the audio. Or you could use Google Voice. These are all free tools that I'm talking about here, right? Let's say you use Google Voice. You're on your laptop or your computer. You go into Google Voice and you just start dictating, this is how I do what I do, or this is how I perform this particular task. And then Google Voice is going to, you know, it, it it's not always at 100%, 
but it'll get you very close. And then before you know it, you already have the, the foundation of a process or a procedure, a step-by-step -step procedure. You might have to do some cleanup, add some step, you know, step, this is actually step one, this is actually step two. But that is a very rudimentary way of starting to get the information out of your head and onto proverbial paper, for lack of a better description. Another thing that you could do is if you do use your phone and you do use a recording device on your phone, audio recording, you just start dictating, again, exactly what you're doing. This is something you can do while you're walking outside or you, you know, you might be sitting in your car, you might be on a train or on a bus and you have a few minutes here and there, you just, you just take your phone, press record, and you start dictating a particular process on your phone. Well, then you take that audio file and you can use a tool called designer.io, D-E-S-I-G-N-R-R.io, and you can actually transcribe your audio file. So again, this isn't necessarily you sitting down in front of a computer, typing out step-by-step -step what you do and how you do it. This is purely using dictation and using these different transcription tools that are available, if not free at a very low cost. And that's one way that you can start to get, again, the processes out of your head and onto paper. There's also video. There's tools like Loom. There's Zoom. Think about if there's a particular software that you use to perform a particular function in your company and you want to be able to document how you do it. You don't want to go through the process of trying to describe it uh, in, in text format and actually showing screenshots. In fact, it's much quicker and easier and simpler to just record a video. Get on a free Zoom account, press the screen share button, start recording yourself. And there you have, let's say, a five to seven minute video explaining how you use QuickBooks or explaining how you use Google Docs or whatever, whatever the technology is. And then you can just store that actually on YouTube. You can store all of these videos as unlisted videos. You create your own YouTube channel for free. So these are all low cost or sometimes free technologies that you can use that are at your disposal right now to start capturing how you do what you do. You want me to keep going, Prosper? Because I can keep going. My, my mind is blown <laughs> right now. I'm, I'm just trying to pick up the pieces while you're speaking because... As you can imagine, we already have all of these tools and we are right. None of the stuff that you spoke about is foreign to say you're going to need to line up uh, for 24 hours for you to get something that we already have. Because from my understanding, a business is an operation that's profitable and it actually works, you know, without your input. And if you can just yes. record yourself in front of a Zoom call like this and then get it transcribed, that already becomes the system's. That was, an, again, exactly. my mind just getting blown. Processing yeah, it, that you can pass on to your team and they can actually do all this work behind you. Wow. Yes. Can I sh share a quick story? Absolutely. Just last week, I was just last week, I was with a client and we had three days to work together on site. And we had all of these processes and she was thinking, oh my gosh, how on earth are we going to get through all of this? And I said, you know what? open up Zoom, start pressing record and describe to me what you're doing and actually open up these different, she had a bunch of different Excel spreadsheets in this, in this case. And it was important to be able to show how she created these spreadsheets, how to use these spreadsheets to manip manipulate certain types of data. And as she would record each video, I would immediately send that video to one of the people on my team. Within five minutes, she would have it transcribed sent back to me. Then we we type out a few of, we would do some cleanup with the transcription. We'd actually put it in a step-by-step -step format. But the point is people had the ability to actually see it in a step-by-step -step procedural format as well as recorded video. Because there are some people who are more visual learners like myself. And then there are those who want to be able to pick up an actual document and read the step-by-step -step instructions. Another tool that I'd like to share with your audience, Prosper, is something that my team and I use that we absolutely love, and it's called Notion. Notion.so. 
Notion is also a very, very low cost tool. And when I say low cost, as of, as of this recording, I'm pretty sure the cost is still $4, four US dollars a month if you sign up for an annual plan. So that's $48 for unlimited storage, unlimited storage. So it's, uh, it's even better than Dropbox or, or Google Docs because it's unlimited storage. And it's so visual. And that is where we house all of our processes. It also has an internal searching capability. So if we type out a process specifically within Notion, technically someone else on the team, if they're looking for, how do we, how do we set up a podcast episode? They can type in how to set up podcast episode and it will take them directly to that particular process within Notion. So again, very low cost. There is a slight learning curve, but I'm confident that once your listeners see it and see the visual nature of this tool, they will absolutely fall in love with it. Oh, well, absolutely. Now I kind of see a lot of things that you've just brought to the table here, Alicia. I mean, you can understand if you're a coach, consultant, or small to medium business that's, um, you know, watching this show right now, growing your business is tough. And things like marketing is probably just one aspect of running a successful business. You know, you go from hiring new staff, balancing books, grow, driving growth, and a whole lot more. And it all feels like a constant balancing act when you're being pulled in multiple different directions all at once. And at the end of the day, your real goal is just to help your clients. You want to maybe spend as much time as possible changing people's lives and solving people's problems. Now, people like Alessia would be there to actually take off a lot of the burdens that are um, pulling you in all of those multiple different directions by actually systemizing your business and actually putting structure to, um, you know, whatever it is that you're working on with, um, you know, the systems and processes that she's talking about. Now, Alessia, somebody's probably sitting at the edge of their seat right now, wondering <laughs> how can I actually get a hold of, first of all, you know, to know a bit about what it is that you can do for them and get to know a, li um, a lot more about how they can actually, um, you know, create a business that's profitable and enjoyable to work in. How can people get a hold of you or what will be the first step for people to actually get started to work with you, Alessia? I would say go to my company's website and that is EQB systems.com. So we don't have equilibria because it's too difficult of a word for people to spell. <laughs> so we, our domain is EQB and that's be like boy systems.com. And that is the best place to go. We have a podcast. We have podcast episodes where we talk about business infrastructure, processes, operations, how to scale. So that's a lot of fun. There's also a book that I've written, as you mentioned at the, the top of the the interview, Prosper. So we have a lot of free resources on the website that people can start reading right now to become more familiar with business infrastructure, the importance of processes, why operations deserves a seat at the table and not just marketing. That's why I'm so grateful to you, Prosper, because I know you have such a strong digital marketing background and it's always, it's always a good day when a marketing person, an expert like yourself, invites a person like me, an operations person, to have a seat at your table so that we can have a conversation because we both bring value to the table and you can't have one without the other. Oh, absolutely. Right? I because mean, I always say, and, and let me know if you agree with this, marketing, marketing represents the promise. Marketing is all about the promise that you're making to your customers. And operations is about... How can you make sure you deliver on that promise? Because you can help your you can help your clients, I know, get those customers coming through the door. But at the end of the day, if you aren't able to fulfill those orders on time or if if promises are broken, that's that's not a good day. It's not a good day at all. And so vice versa, you know, it's it's not good to to be so focused on operations that you ignore marketing because then you won't have any customers. So, <laughs> do, do you so, know what I actually tell my clients? What do you tell? What do you tell them? I actually tell my clients that marketing starts when you close the sale. Mm. All that you're doing prior is, yeah, obviously just gymnastics. Because if you can deliver outstanding results to your clients, then you win their loyalty for life. 
And when customers sing your praises to their family, to their friends and colleagues, or even strangers on a bus, that's when you know you've actually started marketing. Because all the other stuff of bringing customers in, anybody can do that. But it's the retention and actually making sure that people pay, stay, and refer. That's where it actually comes mm. into play. And guess what? Most of that is all operations. Because if you can't keep um, your customers happy and wanting more, then you've actually wasted thousands of ad spend without even generating any lead. Because the first money that you actually derive from a customer, you're only paying back whatever you were uh, paying, you know, all the marketing spend that you're doing before. You see? Wow. Absolutely. Yes. So I, I love it. <laughs> For some people, they would think, oh, yeah, being on social media and being on Facebook Live, that's marketing. Let me tell you something. I believe anybody with a pair of sweatpants and a laptop can do that. Retention is where it's at. Good yes. stuff. I mean, we could go on and on, at least. I know. Constantly. I know. We, we, we need to take this on the road. I'm telling you, <laughs> Prosper. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I really appreciate you inviting our audience to uh, sort of, um, you know, come and, you know, take that first step with you um, so that they can start working with you in, in an amicable way. Now, Alicia, obviously, there's that skeptic in the room, somebody who's just saying, nah, it ain't all about that. I've been, we've been doing things the way we've been doing it, and we don't need to develop super efficient management systems or effective um, you know, well oiled, well oiled machines. I've just been doing work like I've been doing. Um, what what sort of last words do you have for somebody who's just um, you know, saying like they say in Australia, she'll be all right. <laughs> well, I have no words for those people, and 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 let me tell you why I say that because the people who say that to me are people who are not serious about growth. They're not serious about scale. Because when you're when you're scaling to the next level, you absolutely have to have these things in place because it means you have to grow a team. When they're working with you, Prosper, and they have more business now than they can handle, you're at an inflection point. You're either going to continue doing business as usual and potentially implode, or if you want the business to continue to come in, you have to start to get in that infrastructure. You have to start to hire more people. When you hire more people, you don't just release them into the wild and have them do things, you know, the way, however, the way they want to do it. You have to have processes that communicate this is how we perform this particular task. This is the, this is the prosper way of doing this of doing X, of doing Y, because your customers expect consistency also. They expect to have a consistent experience. So whether they work with you, Prosper, or they work with me, and we're, we're both you know associated with your company, they expect to have relatively the same experience. And if they don't, you and I both know an angry customer is so much louder than a happy customer. They will tell their friends and their family and they will go online and they will tweet about it. They'll do a TikTok video about it. And the next thing you know, you have a viral moment for all the wrong reasons. So, so yes, I, I don't spend my time trying to convince people who just aren't sold on it. I just tell them, you know what? There are so many cautionary tales that are out there of people who ignored operations to their detriment. And I just I just list off the cautionary tales and say, oh, you know, go read, go read the story about this person who said that she could deliver emergency meals to Puerto Rico after they had a major hurricane and only to figure out that she couldn't, she, she had she won this multi-million dollar contract with FEMA here in the US, couldn't deliver. And and it was a viral moment for this this lady for all the wrong reasons. So I just I have a whole library of these cautionary tales now. And I just share those stories with people prosper. And then either they're convinced after that or if they aren't. I just kind of leave them alone and go on and go on about my business. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, Alicia, I can't thank you enough for the time that you spent with us on the show today. I mean, obviously, 
our main ethos and uh, focus is to help small to medium businesses create a business that is profitable and enjoyable. And you can only enjoy a business that's functioning without your input 24 seven. Um, and you can only enjoy a business that's actually bringing in, um, you know, record profits because your systems are in place. Thank you so much for the time that you have and the oh. value that you've given us on the show today. Thank you so much, Prosper. You are a breath of fresh air, my friend. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.